Can you hear me okay? I hear you just fine. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, can you see me? You're a bit quiet, though. Uh, okay, I'll That's turn it up. <laughs> okay, I'll get going. Um, uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening uh, to everyone. And uh, it's uh, 9.30 or, or thereabouts in, uh, in uh, snowy Edmonton, Alberta today. <laughs> And uh, I'll be speaking about the knowledge mobilization. Note that all the slides uh, that I'm showing you are openly licensed, except that some of the images are available under fair dealing or fair use uh, in Canada and other countries. Um, it's a sad uh, time we're having now in Alberta. We have a very high number of coronavirus uh, cases and uh, Everybody is cocooning and uh, and staying home as much as much as possible. And uh, as uh, most of you know by now, it, this is having a huge impact on education. And uh, it's uh, now uh, more than 1.4 billion uh, school closures around the world, and uh, so many are now switching to online learning. And uh, our uh, former governor general, uh, uh, Mikhail Jean, uh, she tells us that education is a weapon of mass construction. And uh, we believe that in the 21st century, that online education is going to facilitate uh, this mass construction. Um, the methodology um, I've been using for this uh, information is a web search. We did a literature review, uh, a survey of uh, OER experts, five Canadian and six international, uh, along with a questionnaire and interviews. Uh, the issues we were looking at, uh, effective learning and teaching, quality, awareness, and costs. Um, there was, um, we've looked at effective learning and teaching as a culture change when there is alignment with, with the curricula. Uh, we've looked at non-formal alignment uh, and uh, found it's uh, not as important. And uh, the ease of use or appropriateness of the uh, uh, learning content um, was uh, seen to have some significance. So OAR, I'm gonna go through these quickly because I'm going to assume that everyone understands uh, what OER are at this conference. And uh, uh, the idea of assembly rather than uh, assembling courses, rather than uh, creating them um, is very important to the whole OER concept. And uh, it's the most innovative aspect of open educational resources. Um, or, uh, you can just take a course package bundle, and uh, this is the part that uh, I believe is lacking in open education resources. Uh, many instructors just want the whole course package uh, in a bundle, and they don't want to mix and max and change, etc. Um, good for retention. We know that free access to content prior to class, that it reduces draw the dropout rate. Uh, we know that the quality of uh, the material is not dependent on the type of license, nor the technology that's being used. But we do know that OER are better than commercial content uh, and other types of restricted content uh, because of uh, the accessibility, the possibilities of collaboration, and uh, the ability to improve, update, etc. The, quant the content. One of the most significant problems still in the OER movement is that the knowledge of OER is seriously lacking. Um, once faculty become familiar with it, they become very supportive of open educational resources. And uh, there is some risk of resistance uh, among administrators. <clears throat> The costs, we all know that there are massive savings for students. Free content is a huge boon 
uh, economically for students. Um, they don't buy commercial texts in many situations because they can't afford them. Many students fall into this category. Um, so we believe that open education resources are necessary, uh, but not sufficient for fulfilling the UNESCO strategic development goal four, which is education for all. So why do we need open educational resources? And two main reasons, digital rights management and digital licenses. Um, we call it digital restrictions management because content, commercial content has restrictions on it that are really unaccept unacceptable in an educational context. They put locks onto the commercial content to limit your ability to make use of the content in different circumstances. Um, they've actually used these locks to go into people's computers and remove um, commercial content uh, that has been legally acquired. DRM software, digital rights management, these locks that they put into it, is uh, it needs deep permissions into the operating system. And it can stop and has in the past stopped normal operating system functions. It's defective uh, by design. So they actually design a defect into your device uh, through with these applications. Um, access codes are being used uh, uh, in many uh, uh, universities where students have to pay more in order to access the commercial information. So with these digital locks, you can't copy paste, annotate or highlight. You can't use text to speech, um, which uh, is uh, very important for people who are visually disabled. You can't change the format. You can't move your commercial content from one computer to another. You can't print it out. You can't even move it geographically if you go to a different region. You can't use it after the expiry date. Most commercial content, um, they come and delete it from your computer after the course. And of course, unlike print material, uh, you can't resell it. But I would argue that our device is our property and that DRM, it restricts our freedom to use our property. Our device is our property. It restricts our freedom to use it. And uh, it brings up this question, can we not own and control our own property? That is, this is my iPhone, this is my laptop, and can I not own and control this property? Um, they put locks on our devices, even though we're totally innocent of any crimes, they still lock up our devices and restrict how we can use them. Corey Doctor put it this way, there's no theory of capitalism that says my private property should be regulated by the state because there's a copyrighted work inside of it. Many of us have seen this. We see this all the time in Canada where the video is not available in your country. And um, the commercial content providers have tried to put in application that would actually destroy uh, the device that's using their content if it's not being used in the way they want you to use it. Error 53, um, I hope no one here has heard of it, is it turns, this is a, a deep application in your iPhone and it turns your iPhone into a brick. If you install um, uh, applications not authorized by Apple, um, I believe that they got a lot of flack from it and it, no long it is no longer there, but we don't know that. So Microsoft had an ebook apocalypse and it shows the dark side of DRM. This is a few years ago when Microsoft uh, took down a huge number of ebooks from people's computers. 
So who's really losing? Any obstacle that makes a record harder to listen to is bad news for the artist that made it. So these digital locks uh, don't help the artist. They don't help the creator. They don't uh, help the author. They are there for the sole uh, use and restriction uh, by the uh, uh, commercial content uh, vendor. Now, even more nefarious than the digital locks are the legal protections that they give these locks. Um, these digital licenses re reinforce all of the restrictions that are on digital locks. And they say that owners have no liability even if their product doesn't work. This is what you sign when you press on, I agree to use their content. This is what you're agreeing to. They have no liability. You've agreed they can invade your computer without permission. Uh, they can collect and use your personal data, not just your personal data related to their application, but any personal data on your computer, and that you have a privilege to use but not own the property, the, the, the product. And very important in an educational context, you're prohibited to show your content to others. Um, which makes it very difficult for collaborations among students. And uh, you must accept that you have no rights. So these are the laws that are being put in place in order to support the digital locks. That is, even if you have a right to the content, you cannot break the lock uh, for any reason. It's illegal. So it's basically an idea of we're going to own all of your stuff, whether you like it or not, deal with it. And here's an example of a, 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 di a digital license. I suspect that most of you have never read a digital license. I've read about 40 or 30, 50 of them, and uh, they're very uh, onerous. But this one for microchips um, say that they can arrive in your uh, into your home, announced or unannounced, and whether uh, to take uh, control over your device, whether you uh, like it or not, whether it's located on your premises or elsewhere at any time. And this is what you've agreed to when you click on, I agree. So what happens is uh, you could find yourself in this situation uh, in prison because you showed your wife a page from your ebook. This is how bad it is in the United States and in those countries that have been forced to accept American copyright law. So this is the main argument or the main, um, how can I put it, uh, physical argument for open textbooks. With open textbooks, you can bypass all of these restrictions. We don't need to worry about them. We can copy, paste, text to speech, change the format, print it out, move it geographically, do whatever we want with it. And we retain our privacy and digital rights. I believe that open textbooks, open content are essential for e-learning implementations. <clears throat> Even here, here's an interesting one where in your I agree a statement, you've agreed that it's forbidden for you to use iTunes to create missiles, biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. So be aware that you're not allowed to do that and you've agreed that you won't do it. So it brings up this question. Do you own what you pay for? Vendors can now control how, when, where, and with what specific brands of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. They've brought a new concept into the world. You buy, but you don't get. So we're in a world where you no longer get what you buy. And uh, this New concept is being spread all over. Um, it's bad in education, it's bad in other areas, uh, but uh, 
I think some of you are old enough to remember the world we used to live in, where you bought something and you got it. But now you buy something, but they still own it. Um, Audrey Waters put it this way, we all share and rent on the powerful platforms of Silicon Valley billionaires. This is far from a satisfactory alternative. Cory Doctorow says that it's a return to feudalism where the lords owned everything and the serfs owned nothing. And now it's the companies that own everything, uh, not aristocrats, but still people really do not own anything. And uh, this has entered into many different facets of civilization where uh, you can't run your tractor without the software and they've come in and disabled the software on tractors. So a farmer who owns his tractor uh, only owns the physical tractor, but it will not work without the software. And this is the same for heart pumps, for lights, uh, for cars, everything else. You don't own it. They own it. And somehow the notion of actually owning the things you buy has become revolutionary. If you bought it, you should own it. It's as simple as that, as Kyle Vians tells us. So the answer is openness. Openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. And we can thank David Wiley for reminding us of that. And I'd like to finish off by uh, putting in a plug for uh, some of the indigenous knowledge efforts that uh, we've been doing in Canada, um, that uh, uh, when we're talking about copyright and openness, um, we have to honor indigenous belief systems, respect their protocols, and understand that mainstream views may be value laden and uh, prejudicial. So we have to uh, make exceptions for this. Um, UBC has been very successful in putting out indigenous storybooks as open educational resources. And they've done so by working with indigenous communities, honoring their protocols and bringing language revitalization. That is they're pu pu publishing these OER in the local languages. They're sharing traditional stories and the fact that they're freely available maximizes their impact and, re and reach. And uh, Little Cree Books uh, is an example of that, where they uh, uh, are putting out these books for uh, students. And another good example is in Mesquasis Cultural College, which has had a major OER initiative, and uh, even uh, having translated the Creative Commons uh, into uh, uh, into the Cree language. So the recommendations, <clears throat> one, <clears throat> based on this research, government funded publications should be made freely available to the public using an open license. Creative Commons has been saying this for many years. Educate faculty, staff and administrators on open licensing. Again, create awareness, educate them. Train faculty in assembling, adapting, and reusing OER. Let's have more training. Provide faculty with career incentives and compensation for OER use, um, which a, this was referred to by a previous speaker, and I, I fully agree with her. Advise faculty to search for OER first for courses. That is, do not create OER. I repeat that, do not create OER. Look for what's available, assemble courses. Find out what's out there. Do not reinvent the wheel, use what's out there. Only create when you cannot find anything, uh, anything that will uh, serve your purposes. Make open licenses mandatory in local course creation. Use OER, then awareness will follow. People wonder, how do we make people aware of OER? Well, start using them and publicize your use of them. Let people know that you're using OER, but use them. Support right, local note. OER influencers among staff and students. 
Or just a note to say you should wrap up in the next minute. I'm wrapping up right now. Every uh, day, computers are making people easier to use. Everything you know is wrong. <laughs> I'll finish with these uh, two statements that the Royal Society, the oldest scientific society in the world, says that the restrictions of the commons by patents, copyright, and databases is not in the interests of society and unduly hampers scientific endeavor. And the previous Pope Benedict said, on the part of rich countries, there is excessive zeal for protecting knowledge through an unduly rigid assertion of the right to intellectual property. What does this tell us? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that both science and God is on our side. Remember, we are on the side of the angels. We can go forward and thank you very much for your attention. I love that conclusion, Rory. On the side of angels, thank you so much, Rory. Uh, really fascinating and always uh, 